My brothers and sisters, the topic that's been given to me is a sensitive one and we're faced with social media. Social media has caused people to think very differently now. There's a lot of self-centeredness as well. People are thinking about what makes them happy, but they don't understand what happiness means. And so people are leaving, for example, marriages just because they don't feel happy. Let's begin with the topic that's been given to me. It's part of the seven who will be shaded under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said they will be shaded. What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make you a special person on the day of judgment. He will choose you from among all the trillions of people from the time of Adam until the end of time. And he will put you under his special protection in such a way that you will not feel the heat of the sun that will be only a mile away from your head. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, what is this from? He said, everyone according to the sins which they accumulated consciously when they were in the former life. You deliberately did it. You knew that it was wrong. You knew the consequence, but you went ahead with it anyway. Then Allah chooses special people to protect them from all of this. Who are they? Seven types. Two types that I'm going to talk about today are, number one, and a man whom a woman with prestige or power and beauty calls him, seduces him, and he says, I fear Allah. And the second one I'm going to talk about, and a man who in the middle of the night, when no one was around, he was alone. He remembers Allah. And from that remembrance, his eyes become teary. First question, sisters are asking, I can hear you. You're saying, why is it a man? But automatically, without a doubt, all the scholars of past and present understand and agree that when the Prophet ﷺ says, and a man, it automatically means, and a woman. So let's reverse the hadith now, the first one. And a woman whom a man with power, prestige, and beauty, seduces her or calls her to something haram, and she says, I fear Allah. One brother says to me, young man, one of my students, uh, year nine, you know how they are. He says, bro, I'm going to have the shade of Allah. I said, why? How do you know? He goes, a girl said to me yesterday, hey, let's go out together. And I said, I fear Allah. <laughs> he typed it. I fear Allah. That's it. I'm under the shade. No, no, no. It has to be in a situation like what Yusuf salam was. You all know the story of Yusuf? And he was seduced with the door locked, with no one around. And there was a woman of power and beauty. And she said to him, Hey Talak. It's so seductive the way she did it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed that verse in several different styles that you can recite it in. Hey Talak, he Talak, he Talak, hey Talak. Which shows us that she tried every other, every bound, every way. And Yusuf salam is a slave. Nobody cares if he sleeps with her. Even if he does, she's the one that's going to receive the shame. She's meant to be of high status in society. And Yusuf salam is extremely drop-dead gorgeous. There is no one more beautiful than him except for Adam salam. And what does he say? I seek protection from Allah. You tell that to a common man today, they'll say, what do you mean protect? You know, this is, the, this is paradise for us. This is what we've always wanted. This is our dream come true. And we know the rest of the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him in high esteem in the Quran. And in the end, he actually chose the dungeon than being with that woman. Not only that, even other women came along just to show you the intensity of it. He is not a human being. He is a malak. He is an angel from how they were mesmerized and hypnotized by his looks. And they started telling him, Yusuf, just do what she wants, man. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're gorgeous. We don't want you to end up in prison. Just do it. Just do it. They want to protect him, right? 
And he went back asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and crying in the night, which is ironic. The man who remembers Allah in the night and cries. That's exactly what Yusuf alayhi salam did following that incident. And he made an intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabb, please, please put me in prison. It's more beloved. Why? Because the prison is going to be his pathway to Jannah. Her pathway is going to be to hellfire. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, there will come a time in the future where the young Muslims, especially the young people, he acknowledges that there will come a time where it will be so difficult for people to stick to their religion strongly. The person you look at and you say, wow, he or she is religious. If you look at their life, they're struggling big time, man. They're struggling. It's really hard. It's not easy. And it's like a person holding on to a coal of fire. But they're trying, they're struggling. Why? Because their love for what is in store for them in the hereafter. They want Allah to be pleased with them. There's nothing more beautiful and makes you more happy than two connections. The connection to Allah and the connection to guess what? Your family. The connection to your parents, the connection to your siblings, the connection to your cousins, and the connection to your wife and husband. That makes you happy. Connection. I'm not talking about lust. I'm not talking about desires. I'm not talking about attraction. I'm talking about attachment. And that is the happiness that people are striving for. An attachment. An attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an attachment with your family. My brothers and sisters in Islam, a religious person is going to struggle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be merciful and forgiving? Do you think He's just He's going to expect everybody to be perfect? No. Young people, you are not expected to be perfect. You're not expected to live a life without sin. Every one of us sins. There is haram everywhere. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to judge you for every little haram that you do. Even a man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I feel bad, I feel bad, man, I feel bad. He says, what did you do? He goes, I, I, you know, I kissed and hugged and I, I went and I saw this girl. And he says, look, do you pray? Do you fast? Do you do your sadaqah? He goes, yes, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He goes, go. They will wipe it all away for you. I don't want the young people to misunderstand that hadith. <laughs> Listen, a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not giving him an excuse. He's not giving him an open door for it. He realized he's ashamed. The guy's about to slap himself out. He wants to repent. That's it. There's no, long, there's no need for the Prophet to sit there drilling him and telling him off. And that is the foundation that you always want. Rasulullah told us that one of the signs of the last hour is that haya, shame, will be lost. People don't care, it becomes normalized. Easy. Who cares if I've got a girlfriend or boyfriend? Everybody has. Nudity is normal. So what? Brothers and sisters in Islam, one of our fitra is shame and modesty. One of these instinctive natures is that every human being shares, I don't care what you say, Muslim, non-Muslim, boy, girl, is modesty and shame. The feeling of modesty and shame naturally comes into you. I have children. You know, there comes a time they... You take, your, you take your daughter to the toilet, suddenly she reaches an age where she says, I'll go by myself. This is fitrah. Modesty and shame is inside of us. We are born with it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this religion to suit your fitrah. So that means it has to have solutions for you. But we are the ones who corrupt ourselves. Allah says in the Quran, and the nafs, the nafs are your desires and yourself, you, who you are, the way the human being is, the way he made it. Allah gave the self two things, the tendency and the feelings to want to do shameful things and the tendency to do things that are pure and good. Whoever purifies themselves has succeeded and whoever obeys their desires, just does whatever their desires tell them, their temptations and lusts, has lost. Life is a test brothers and sisters. The Prophet Sallallahu warned us as well. He said, There will come a time where people, Fahisha becomes manifest among them. It becomes easily seen. Fahisha means the dirty sexual acts and they are the forbidden ones. Because they harm you and don't suit you, the human being. It's the same reason why Allah forbid alcohol and pork. Pork is najas, it's dirty, not in itself. But consuming it is not good for you. Your immune system is not fit 
to digest the meat of the pig. It's going to harm you. It's going to cause you diseases such as hepatitis in your liver. That's why it's haram. Who knows why Allah makes something haram? It's harmful to you. When somebody forbids something from you because it's harmful to you, what does it tell you about that person? Like your parents. Does it tell you that they care about you or want a hard life for you? Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things haram and sometimes we don't know the whole reason for it because our intelligence is not strong enough and wide enough to know. Rasulullah said, whenever fahisha is manifest and spread among a people, widespread, everybody does it and it becomes a norm, they start promoting it. They talk about it as if it's normal. He's my boyfriend, that's my boyfriend. I did this or I did that. A lot of them are lying, by the way, but it's, you know, they just want to look good. And so the girls or boys who hear this from their friends, they think it's true. So they go and do it themselves and then they fall into problems. They just think about their feelings and desires which have just, subhanAllah, exploded as soon as they hit puberty. Rasulullah said it becomes normal. He's got a girlfriend, how cute. Oh, you haven't got a girlfriend yet? You're a loser. 30 years old, never been with a girl, still a virgin. I feel sorry for you, man. Then we hear this news. It's called classical conditioning. Anyone that studied psychology before? Social media makes you think like that, especially those who are looking for a relationship. You look at social media and you see this false image of a beautiful, loving couple. They don't care about how they got together. It doesn't really matter. And then you start to think this is what it is. And you come into a marriage or a relationship and you are expecting something that you saw over and over again. When you don't get that expectation, you feel that you have been cheated. You're not happy. This is wrong. You're not happy in the marriage. You get out of it because of the expectations. Brothers and sisters, classical conditioning. When people become normalized to these haram fahisha among them, he says serious sicknesses start to spread among them as well. When you talk about terminal illnesses for fahisha, what first comes to your mind? Rasul said they will appear and pain of hurt and sickness that never really existed before in people who existed before them. Some scientists might argue that they just didn't know what it was. But they can't prove that. Our Prophet told us they didn't exist before. Brothers and sisters, let me share with you something. When you fall into an interest in someone, you go through three stages that scientists have studied. Number one, there is the lust stage. When you lust for someone, two hormones are released in your brain. For the men, more testosterone. For the girls, more estrogen. But they both have estrogen and testosterone, except in lesser levels than each other. This hormone does nothing except it serves your reward, your reward center. It's like once you feel it the first time, you want to feel it again. No purpose except feeling. Testosterone, estrogen. Once you fulfill that need, the testosterone and estrogen goes away and all you're left with is the after effects. Allahu alam what they are. Once you fall into lust, there is a second stage if you continue following that relationship and it's called attraction. When you, fall, when you get to the stage of attraction, it lasts for weeks or months. This usually happens in the halal way, they are the people who are engaged to be married. Attraction releases hormones called dopamine and other hormones and it lessens something called serotonin. Serotonin gives you satisfaction, security and so on. The others, they make you energetic. You start to fantasize a lot. You start doing things you never did before. And then you say, wow, he's changed me. She has brought out something in me that I've never seen before. He said words to me that no one's ever said to me before. They just flooded me. Brothers and sisters, this is not real. These are just the hormones telling you that. It's like watching a mad movie, Fast and Furious. It lasts for about a few weeks and months. And what happens is that you feel this beautiful thing coming, which is nice in the halal way, beautiful. Enjoy it in the halal way. It's beautiful. It's one of the best things you can ever, you know, and really embrace it because you're not going to feel it much again later on. But, but, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't leave you there. If you follow that relationship, it turns into something beautiful, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this is where the real relationship is. And it's called attachment. This is the husband and wife. This is a family attachment. And attachment releases a beautiful hormone called oxytocin. And that is the hormone that makes you feel 
secure, safe, loved, purpose, reason, importance, self-esteem, value. When you get married, everybody values you and they look at you differently, isn't that correct? <laughs> this other young fellow I remembered now. He comes to me, he goes, Astaghfirullah I committed zina. He goes, but I'm safe brother, I'm safe. I go, what do you mean you're safe? He goes, she's not a woman of power and beauty. When the Prophet ﷺ said a woman of her power and beauty, what he's saying, any man or woman that your community or society see as desirable. Even zina with a normal person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses it. Whoever does this act shall surely meet a terrible wrath, except he or she who repents. Brothers and sisters, some people they say, I'll have a girlfriend or boyfriend now, I'll commit the haram because then I will repent later. We say to you, you are like the brothers of Yusuf. Brothers and sisters, I had a sister. She said to me, do I have to tell my future husband, the guy who's asked for my hand, do I have to tell him that I've got S? Muslim sister in hijab, everything. Beautiful sister, loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But unfortunately, in the past, she fell into haram. You repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they still stay. Should I tell him? I said, of course you have to tell him. But why? Islam covers the sin. You shouldn't tell your sins. I said, that's different. He's going to get infected. If you get pregnant, your children are going to get infected unless you get it treated. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, stay away, don't come close, don't do this. Isn't that right? It is time to break this taboo and to address it and talk about it. There is no taboo in Islam when it comes to guiding people to the right path. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Al Quran and Sunnah tells us the solutions to these things. Now I'm going to tell you the obvious one that everybody's going to roll their eyes about, I know. Marriage is the best solution. It'll definitely minimize it a lot. We have problems. Parents are stubborn. Some parents are too traditional. Some parents, they refuse just because of his look or because he's not from the same culture or whatever. Then you have young people. They don't want to tell their parents anything. They don't want to get their advice because automatically they've stereotyped their parents. Oh, they're old-fashioned. They'll give you advice, man. They've got experience. Your parents have made mistakes. Have a conversation with your parents from a young age. Do not be ashamed to do that. When I was in year seven, sex education was brought into year seven, but you had to get your parents' permission. What do you think my dad did? So what happens? I said, but dad, what am I going to do? I'm going to fail the test. He goes, I will teach you. And he did. And he taught me with the adab. Islam, when it teaches you about it, it teaches you how to respect the person, and how to develop a relationship, not just bodily feelings. Teaching and educating our children from a young age and communicating with them as young as eight and nine years old, talk about puberty. Talk with your parents about it. Listen to them. As a parent, I would love my child to come and talk to me about it. I will feel a bit safer. I'll be, feel a bit secure that my child is coming back and forth to me, even if they're thinking the wrong way. Now, I know, as you become a teenager, you can't afford to get married. I'm really an advocate for people to get married at a younger age. And I'm always talking to parents. We can do it. It used to be done all the time. Us as Muslims, we can't afford to be like those who, you know, don't want to get married, but they, that they have relationships in the haram way. We can't afford to that because if you can't get married and you can't have an intimate relationship with a girl or a boy, you're stuck. The grave's going to be your partner. You can't. We can't afford to say, I don't want to get married. What else are you going to do? And then fall into haram? You can't. Lastly, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you fall into haram, don't go around telling people about it. To feel better about yourself, you confess it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him, Ya Rab, I'm weak. I did this and I did that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. But when you say it, there's a connection with you and Allah. You, you feel it. And then suddenly you start to cry. You, you feel, you actually cry when you do that. Because it's so intimate and special between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, how beautiful that feeling is. I don't know if you guys have been through it. I miss that feeling. And sometimes, you know, you sit up at night and you make wudu and you just say, Oh Allah, I'm weak. I've got problems. 
Wallahi, Allah's, Allah opens doors for you after that. Wallahi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you things from places you never expected. Repent to him, try your best to avoid the haram as much as you can. If you can't, repent, do good deeds to wash it away. It's called taqwa. Allah says, I will open doors for you. I will open doors for you. Allah al And Allah promises and guarantees those eyes that cry in the middle of the night when you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I'm going to protect you on a day of judgment with me.